name is Willie Michelson. I'm uh, the executive director of COINS, uh, which is a nanoscience and nanoengineering uh, center here on campus. And uh, we're, we're, uh, our goal is to enable uh, uh, applications of environmental monitoring using nanotechnology. And I'm sure you've all heard the word nanotechnology, but maybe some of you don't really know what that people are talking about when, when they say nanotechnology. So the first thing I'm going to, to, to do is just give an overview of what, what is nanotechnology. So if you're like me and you don't know something, the first thing you do is you go to Google and you type it in and try to figure out what it is. So if you type nanotechnology into, into Google, it, it, it shows uh, that it's a branch of engineering that deals with things that are smaller than 100 nanometers. Okay, so it's something that's small. Uh, and, but what's a nanometer? We'll find out in a little bit. So nanotechnology, shortened to nanotech, is a study of, in, of the controlling of matter at the atomic and molecular scale. Okay, so it's on the atomic and molecular scale, and it's not just small things, it's controlling that, those small things. Another definition is uh, nanotechnology is handling about a billionth of a meter, so that tells us what a nanometer is. At the molecular level, atoms and molecules are handled as individual components to create materials, small clusters of animal, the atoms, excuse me, with unique characteristics. Okay, so another definition, if you go to nano.gov, real website, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll get this definition. Nanotechnology is the understanding and control of matter at dimensions with, between approximately 1 and 100 nanometers, where unique phenomena enable novel applications. Okay, so what does that mean in, in regular English? So understanding and control of matter. So it's not, not nano by accident. You're actually trying to make nano things. Nanoparticles are, are, are all over the place. They've been around for millions of years, billions probably. Um, and, and, and so but it's not just small things. It's controlling those small things. One from 100 nanometers. Okay, so it's really, really small. Unique phenomena. Okay, it's not just small, but it's small and different. And finally, it enables novel applications. So it's something new. It's not just all those things, it's also enabling novel applications. Okay, so nanotechnology timeline. What, when, when did this originate? So, uh, over 50 years ago, the uh, famous physicist Richard Feynman said, it would be in principle possible for physicists to synthesize any chemical substance the chemist writes down. Give the orders to the physicist, and give the orders, and the physicist synthesizes it. How? Put the atoms where the chemist says, and you make the substance. So this is sort of a new way of thinking uh, to, to actually take individual atoms and, and construct something out of it, rather than uh, having them just do it by, by their own natural processes. So then the first use of the word nanotechnology was in 1974, um, by Norio Taniguchi, where he's talking about production of very small nanometer-sized objects, which is common in today's uh, computer industry. And then it became popularized by uh, Eric Drexler when he wrote the book, uh, Engines of Creation, The Coming Era of Nanotechnology. And one thing, the, probably the most popular part of that book was, was something called the gray goo. And as he said, the gray goo threat, the gray goo threat makes one thing perfectly clear, we cannot afford certain kinds of accidents. So what the gray goo was, was this, this, these, these nano box things that would, would self-replicate, and they self-replicated out of control and took over the world. So that's just a reminder that we don't want to go crazy with this nano stuff and try to uh, do something that, that is not, not uh, sustainable. So it's very important to be, to be conscious about, just as with any science, to be conscious about what you're, what you're doing. Now, in 1989, scientists wrote IBM on, with xenon atoms on, on a nickel surface using a scanning tunnel microscope. So that's, here's a little image right here, and what you see, each one of those dots is, is a xenon atom that's on a nickel surface. So here, 30 years after, finally came up with this wild idea to move uh, uh, elements around, move uh, atoms around, they actually did that uh, with the scan tunneling the microscope in, in, at IBM. And then, 12 years later, there was the nanotechnology initiative that was created, and, it, and, and it was, uh, its goal was to advance world-class uh, research and development programs, foster transfer of technologies for commercial and public benefit, develop and sustain resources and a skilled workforce, and then also, uh, finally, uh, support responsible development of nanotechnology. Okay, so how small is a nanometer? So here we have a chart, and on, on the uh, left-hand side we have things that are natural, and on the right-hand side you have things that are man-made. So in the millimeter range, you have things like ants. It's a millimeter, pretty small, but you can see it pretty easily. And another thing is the head of a pin, again, small, and, and most, most people can see that. Um, now, when you get in the micron range, you start looking at things like dust mites, um, fly ash, the, the width of a human hair. And then on the man, things man-made side, you have things, MEMS, uh, microelectromechanical systems. And these are things that are in your phones to, to say which way's up. They're in your, your cameras as well. They're also in your, your cars to say when you crashed. 
to, to deploy the airbag and things like that. So these little, there's these little gears, I mean, about you know, mic micrometers in size, so a millionth of a meter in size, um, and, and they're used in everyday uh, technology. So again, another thing on the, the micron size is red blood cells. So that's at the micron scale, so one millionth of a meter. So now you go down another, divide by another thousand, you get into the nanometer range. And on the, the, the things uh, naturally, you have DNA is only a few nanometers in diameter, you have uh, uh, enzymes, ATP synthase is, a, is an enzyme, and those are only a few nanometers in diameter. And also atoms, so actual atoms are only tenths, a tenth of a nanometer apart. And then on the things man-made side, you have a nanotube, um, other, other sorts of uh, nano, nano objects, the carbon nanotube is a, a sheet of graphite, um, or, or buckyballs, it's an atomic replica of a soccer ball, essentially. So these, this gives you an idea of what the scale is. If you're still looking for a little bit more what that means, so here's a scanning electron micrograph of carbon nanotubes and a human hair. And so a human hair, the width of a human hair, is about 100,000 times bigger than a carbon nanotube. So what would that mean? Uh, practically, so, so again, if you took a carbon nanotube and you were to, to expand it to, to make it 100,000 times bigger, you'd get something that looked like a human hair. And if you're taking the width of a human hair and multiply that by 100,000, you'd get about the size of a house. So what that means is that if you can imagine a carbon nanotube has a strand of hair, then a strand of hair would be as big as your house. So these things are extremely, extremely small. Okay, so what's different about nano? So it's, it's small, but, but who cares? Why is it different? One of the things that's different is that because it's really small, you have things called quantum properties, which can dominate over bulk properties. So I'll give, give an example of that. So let's take a bulk semiconductor. It's a, it's a crystal of atoms that are laid out periodically in three dimensions. And if you were to look at what that thing looks like, it's, it's pretty awfully boring. It's usually pretty dark uh, uh, gray or, or black. However, if you take a quantum dot, which is a small nanometer-sized crystal, and you were to look at its optical properties, it's very optically exciting. It's, it, the, the fluorescence of these particles can depend on the size of the particles. So you don't just get one standard blah color. You can get any color you want by tailoring the size of these objects. So what's going on there? So if you take a bulk semiconductor and you shine light on it, say you had a laser or just out of any light, you excite something called an electron hole pair or an exciton. And this, this, this electron and hole uh, will orbit each other just like planets orbit uh, the sun or just like electrons orbit an atom. And they have, they'll have a characteristic uh, radius of which they would like to orbit. Now when you get down into the nanometer regime, you have, you have a quantum dot and you shine light on it, you'll still excite this electron hole pair. However, it has to live on that quantum dot. It can't just orbit any radius it wants, so it's confined to live on that quantum dot. And that squeezing of, of those, that, that, that ex, those excited electron hole pair makes it to where its energy, the energy of that excitation, depends on the, the diameter. So what, what happens is when these things recombine, you get a light that emits, light is emitted, and the, so what happens is that light that's emitted depends on the size. So you make the thing larger, it has a lower energy, and it's more red in color. Make it smaller; it's more blue in color. So you can tailor your 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 uh, the optical properties of your material by tailoring the size. Okay, so that's one thing that's different. What else is different? So the length scale are the same or even smaller than biological length scales. So what's what's an example of that? So here you have a, a gecko. Have you ever seen a gecko? It can climb up walls. It can even stand on the, the the ceiling. And so if you look at the macro scale, you have a, a gecko or some sort of lizard. And you look at the meso scale, which means in between. You see its foot. You can see it has some sort of lamella on its on its feet there. And if you look on the micro scale, you can see that there's actually some fibers on there. And then you go down to the nanometer region, you see that these things are only nanometers in diameter. And so the, the geckos use nanotechnology to climb their their the, the ceiling or or, or uh, stand on, stand on the uh, climb up the wall or stand on the ceiling. So here you see a scanning electron micrograph of real a real gecko foot. And you can see these long nanofibers with spatula tips and uh, researchers have been making synthetic gecko adhesive out of polymers using the exact same thing. This is done at, by Ron Fearing and others uh, uh, here at Berkeley. And so this is a way that we're actually using nanotechnology to, to mim uh, mimic biology. Another example is, uh, this is um, using nanotechnology for targeted drug delivery. So here's a uh, microsphere coated with nanowires. And these nanowires, if you tailor them to be the same size as these microvilli, which are these little hair-like particles that are all in your in intestines and in your lungs, these, their interaction between these can be very strong. And so you can take 
these, these, so here's the scanning electron microgap of this microsphere, and here's the microvilli. Now these things bind extremely strong to them. And so what you could use this for is uh, targeted uh, drug delivery. So you could put this in, a lot of times you take a pharmaceutical and 90% of it just goes right through your system. And this way you can, you can tailor it to where it would bind to certain things and, and target that delivery. So you can either put in the inner, in the inside of this sphere or just embed it on the outside with the nanowires to, to have targeted drug delivery. Now this is in the research phase, no, no, this hasn't been commercialized yet. Um, but this is a way you can target drug delivery. Another thing you could do is you could actually put certain proteins on those nanowires and they'll have a certain binding affinity, so to, to bind to certain particular types of cells. Another example of, of nanotechnology with biology is, uh, is here's uh, um, some fluorescence images, and uh, the, uh, the red are fluorescent nanoparticles, much like I showed in the first part, and the, the green is a fluorescent dye, conventional ways of imaging biological materials. And the problem with the, the, the green dye is that, uh, so here the green dye again is on the inside of the cell and the red is on the outside, and here it's the exact opposite on top. So the problem is that after only three minutes of exposure to, 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 the, to the UV, you're, you get bleaching and you've lost your, 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 the fluorescent dye has lost its ability to fluoresce. And so if you use nanoparticles, they don't lose this, this, this they don't have this property of, of degrading over time. And so you can actually image for long, much longer periods of time and, and do studies where, where with conventional fluorescent dyes, you can only do it for a matter of minutes. A third, or uh, another example uh, is, is, is as, I, as I said, you can actually take a nanoparticle, here's a gold nanoparticle, and put a specific protein on there that binds sp to specific uh, cells, and you can, you, can you can tailor those to bind to only cancer cells. And so if you were to take this nanoparticle and, and put a certain protein on there, it would bind to, say, only a certain type of cancer cell. And then you could take this and you could shine light on it, much like you would do normal radiation therapy. However, there'd be a, in a much, the, the gold nanoparticles would, would uh, absorb the light much more, and you have these, the gold nanoparticles actually come inside the cell, these things called endosomes. And the, they, would, they would absorb this heat, they would boil the water, and the cell would then explode. And so you could use this to, to, to bind only to specific types of cells, the ones you want to destroy, and then have an increased effect on any sort of treatment you're going to do to that cell, rather than just irradiating the entire body. Okay, so that's a, another example. So a final example I'd like to show is uh, the surface area to volume ratio becomes extremely large. So this is uh, probably, the, I think, the most important of, of, of uh, nanomaterials. Um, so let's just look. So if you had a cube of length r, the surface area goes as the, the dimension squared, and the volume goes as the dimension cubed. So if you were to take the surface area and surface and divide the surface area divided by the volume, you'd get r squared divided by r, or it would go as 1 over r. So, so that means that if you had smaller particles, you have a much larger surface area. So if you took a cube, and then you were to break it into a bunch, 10 little pieces, you'd actually get 10 more, 10 times the surface area. And so this is important for a lot of different technologies, uh, anything that has to do with surfaces. So catalysis, catalysis is a surface uh, reaction. Uh, batteries, all those chemical reactions that drive electrical current in batteries are done on the surface. <laughs> filters, again, if you wanted to filter something, you want to have lots of surface area for things to bind on. Composites, if you wanted to integrate these nanomaterials with other polymers or other sorts of materials, they, the interface is all on the surface, and so you want to have something with a high surface area. And then again, sensors. So, well, sensors. Sensors are, are, are this is very important because if you're going to sense the environment or sense anything, it, everything interacts with its environment through the surface. So, so uh, the, the, the larger surface area you have, the much more interaction you have with the, the surface. So here's an example. This is an anode of a standard battery. It has micron-sized particles. And then if you, you take a, an anode made from nanocrystals, you have a much higher surface area and you can get much higher currents uh, with the same volume of, or, or mass of, of your battery. And this is uh, not just uh, in the research phase. This is, this is in commercial, uh, uh, this is commercialized. Uh, A123 Systems is a nanotechnology company, came out of MIT, and they have this uh, the nanophosphate. So typically you have a phosphate uh, um, microparticle, and the lithium ions have to interpolate in there for lithium ion batteries. What they've done is they've had a, found a way to, to stabilize very small, uh, under 0.1 micron or 100 nanometer nanocrystals of these phosphates. So you can get much faster interpolation into these nanocrystals and, and much faster deintercalation, so you can charge really fast and discharge really fast. And so here's the charging plot, so you charge to full capacity of, um, in a matter of five minutes, 
And these are not just for, these are not low power batteries. These things are being used, being used in cars, in power tools. So these things, this, these large surface areas enable such large currents depending on for, for the size that they are. And so you can get immense currents and very fast charging and discharging times uh, compared to, to, to conventional batteries. Another area where uh, the surface area makes a difference, and then this is sort of looking at biology, is you look at the lotus leaf, it has a property called superhydrophobicity. So what that means is that water droplets, they're repelled by it, but not only are they repelled by it, but they actually form almost a complete sphere. It's almost like they're levitating on top of this uh, lotus leaf. And if you look at the nano scale on this, the surface of this, this leaf, this is a computer generated image. Um, so you have, if you look at it, they have waxy bumps that are nanometers in size, nanometer in, 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 in uh, scale. And so what that does is it increases the surface area per projected area, per, per, um, per, per yeah, projected area. And so what that means is that in order for the water to, to wet that, in order for it to spread out on it, it has to uh, touch much more surface area than if it was just flat. And so that, the water doesn't like wax or water doesn't like oil, so it actually will beat up and actually levitate on top of the surface. And so this has been used for um, uh, clothes. So you have um, clothes that have these nano-sized uh, fibers on them, polymer fibers in them, and they actually won't, they, they will not wet. And uh, you can say, why don't you just wear a raincoat? Well, you could just wear a raincoat, but who wants to walk around with rubber on? You get the nice feel and breathability of cotton, but you pour water or whatever you want on it, and it just rolls right off. So, so an example of, of this uh, is, what you see here is this is uh, an Im uh, uh, a video of uh, nanoglass. Let's see if this is going to work. So on the, on the left-hand side, you have uh, just a regular petri dish, just normal, normal glass. And on the right-hand side, you have nano-sized glass that's been put onto the surface of that. So you see what they can do is drop water on here. If you drop water on the normal petri dish, it just wets, it spreads around, not much happens. But when you drop it on the surface of the nanoglass, it beads up just like it does on lotus leaf. And it will not wet. And so, you know, you can use this for non-stick pans, or you can use this for, for mu mu a lot of other, other things. If you, a lot of, for wind turbines, for example, sorry, steam turbines, you don't want the water to sit there because it decreases your efficiency. So you put nano-sized materials on there and it will not uh, uh, affect the, it will not wet it and you'll be able to get much more efficiency out of your, your steam turbine. So you just, it's almost like it's levitating, you know, it's, it looks like water in space almost, because it is, it's actually almost completely removed from that surface, because it actually, the amount of surface area that it would have to cover in order to wet that surface is immense. Okay, so just um, to conclude, these are the three, three, three um, examples of, of what makes nanotechnology different. So where is this, where, what are potential nanotechnology applications? Medicine, again, there's diagnostics, drug delivery, uh, energy, batteries, solar cells, um, fuel cells for the environment. There's sensors, filtration, carbon sequestration. Again, it has a large surface area. can absorb a lot of material per, per gram. Electronics, um, memory storage, uh, thermal management, industrial so composite materials, consumers, uh, sunscreens, uh, cosmetics, textiles, sporting goods. And so these are all the potential areas. And what I've highlighted here in red are, are things that actually have made it to the market already. And you'll be seeing these uh, come into the market much more, uh, more and more as, as time goes on. So just uh, to conclude the first part of my talk, uh, what is nanotechnology? Again, nanotechnology is understanding and control of matter at the dimension between 1 and 100 nanometers, uh, where unique phenomena enable novel applications. So there's three, three I highlighted three uh, uh, properties that make nanomaterials different. They're small, so their quantum properties can dominate. They are on the same or even smaller than biological length scales, which has interesting uh, ramifications, and also uh, they have extremely large surface area to volume ratio. So they're entering a wide range of markets. Uh, they'll bring great benefit, but uh, we, we will have to sustain these things uh, uh, responsibly, uh, develop them responsibly, make sure we don't contaminate there. There's a lot of uh, um, worry about what potential adverse effects from nanotechnology could be. And people are working on making sure that that's not, not going to happen. Okay, so that's just sort of a, an introduction to, to what nanotechnology is in general. Now I'd like to get a little bit uh, more into the research that we're doing at COINS. Uh, and and our, our goal is to, to enable environmental monitoring. So again, the mission is to inspire and realize uh, applications directed toward monitoring environmental conditions. And there's three main applications we're going for. Personal environmental monitoring, something you can hold. Uh, 
community-based environmental monitoring. This would be a fixed network, something on lampposts, on, on, on lightposts, uh, stoplights that could give you a, a network, a map of what the environmental conditions are, and then mobile environmental monitoring. We'll go into a little more detail what, what those things are. Uh, personal environmental monitoring, so, you know, there's pollution. Some people are very uh, susceptible. People with asthma, for example, are very susceptible to environmental conditions. Uh, when the center started, uh, they thought that they had this backpack technology where you'd have this very heavy backpack that had pumps and it was very loud and it would, it would sample and measure what the environmental pollutants were. There's been some advances here where the, these things can be handheld, they're still quite heavy and, and very expensive, but you can have a handheld device uh, for one particular uh, analyte. This is an example of a, a volatile organic compound uh, sensor. Uh, and so our goal is to make these uh, uh, much, much smaller, lower cost, and something that people can easily use, and, and, and eventually something that will interface with cell phones and even be embedded inside cell phones. So for the community-based monitoring, here you see there's a natural gas explosion in San Bruno uh, a couple years ago. Uh, that could have been prevented had, had there been uh, an array of, of monitors. Uh, also pesticides. Pesticides, can they, they put them on the crops, but a lot of times they, they drift away or they get uh, built up in, in, in groundwater. So our goal is to, 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 for example, put on these lampposts. Here's something that we've actually developed, a little uh, sensing platform that, that can communicate wirelessly. It can uh, measure sensors. It can interface with energy scavenging devices, and I'll get into all that later. So we, uh, again, we want to uh, enable fixed area, fixed broad area coverage, um, and also semi-portable monitors for, for real-time feedback. A lot of times when you, people want to go measure something, they go to the field, they take a sample, they go to the lab, two weeks later they get the results, and they say, oh, you shouldn't be drinking your water. But realize you, you'd want to know that when you're drinking the water, not two weeks later. Or you shouldn't be breathing the air, you should stay inside, or so on and so forth. Okay, mobile environmental monitoring. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of examples where you don't want to send a person to go do something such as after an earthquake. Here's a picture from Haiti. Or, uh, you know, after a nuclear crisis, uh, where they have a meltdown, or on the verge of meltdown. You don't want to be walking people into there because it's very dangerous. Here, the buildings can collapse here, you can get very high doses of radiation. And so there are sort of so-called deployable chemical detection systems. Uh, however, they're, they're not very uh, mobile. They're about the size of a refrigerator or a washing machine, and they can monitor uh, you know, uh, toxic gases and things like that. So our goal is to take uh, uh, on the points followed to put uh, sensors on there and have this thing be able to go into small areas, um, communicate wirelessly with rescue personnel or other, other uh, devices or people, and uh, have the ability to reach confined spaces. Okay, so. Just here's some, some block diagrams about how these things would be built. Um, so you'd have a coin, a sensor that would, just, for example, me measure uh, pesticides or explosives or some toxic molecule, and then you'd have interface electronics to measure that, and then you'd have a power supply to, to power both of these two things. And then you'd, it, ideally you'd have something where, where people, everyone has a cell phone, or, and, and smartphones are going to be more and more prevalent, prevalent. So it'd be a good idea to have something that could interface with the smartphone, either plug into it and you just add your little uh, personal monitor on there, or it would be something that would be sitting, say, in your room, and you would be able to just talk to it over the, over, uh, the Wi-Fi or over Bluetooth. So community monitoring, again, you'd have a point sensor that would, that would uh, detect something, and uh, you have interface electronics. What would be different here is you'd have an energy harvester. These would be, um, the personal monitor you could recharge every day would be no problem, but these would like to be fixed and leave them there. So you'd have an energy harvesting apparatus, such as a solar cell or a vibrational scavenging device or a thermal electric device. Uh, and then you'd be able to, to, to send this uh, with, a, with a wireless moat and send them and be able to map them, much like you can you know, look at Google Maps and then look at traffic. You could look at Google Maps and look at what the environment and the district were. Okay, so mobile monitoring. Uh, again, same sort of thing. You have sensors and, and interface electronics on there. However, you have a, a crawler. So you have a, the crawler has a motors and actuators, has legs. It has these gecko adhesives that, that I mentioned earlier, these sort of nanofiber, polymer nanofibers to be able to climb all over the place. Um, and then uh, it has its own sort of onboard electronics to control the, the, the actuation of the, the legs and things like that. It has cameras and gyrometers and things like that. So in order to enable this, this, this the, these applications, we have five areas of research with which we uh, are engaged in. So they are energy, wireless, sensing, mobility, and electronics. And each one of these components is, is important to be in order to, to enable and realize these types of applications. So we have a broad uh, uh, base of, of faculty researchers. Uh, we're at four campuses. The bulk of us are at, here at Berkeley. We have uh, a few people in Caltech, Stanford, and UC Merced. We have uh, 10 represented departments and uh, many, many faculty working on, on, on 
very applied research and also very basic research trying to understand the fundamental properties of these nanomaterials. So the first uh, thrust, as we call it, uh, I'll go into is the sensing thrust. So the goal is uh, to develop state-of-the-art nanotechnology to, to enable these, these, these three applications. And two examples I'll, I'll give today are uh, using phase display, which I'll tell you what that is, to create selective coatings and then integrating these with, car, uh, with, with ultra-sensitive ultra uh, nanoelectronic sensors. So uh, these sensors, again, the, the, the carbon nanotube or graphene, um, these nano uh, devices are very high surface area, so they can be very sensitive to their environment. But you need a way to be selective. You want to know what you're sensing. So we've used this phase display to create very selective uh, captures. And then also go into a low-power microbeaded nanoparticle-based sensors. So uh, conventional approaches for, for, for sensing a lot of times deal with polymers. You have a, a polymer it has a, a certain a monomer that then is linked together. And you have a single binding site. You have something here, and this, this is your target molecule. Say so this is um, you know, some, some toxic molecule that you would like to sense. It would bind to one of these things, but this, this one of these binding sites. However, they're all the same all over the place. So um, one approach is to take, instead of using conventional polymers, we use biopolymers, things called peptides, where they have amino acids that link, link to each other. And so you can tailor these things. There's, 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 many different, there's 12 different types of uh, amino acids. So you can tailor these things to where they have uh, multiple binding sites. And so when you have multiple binding sites, you have a higher, the binding energy is higher. And so you get a much more selective binding to your, your analyte of interest. So how is that done? So that's done taking these, uh, these bacteriophages, which are um, viruses that, that eat bacteria. And so what you do is you take it with a random allotment. You can just make, you can uh, just take a random allotment of these, these bacteriophages. And they have all, you have these proteins displayed on the bottom, which are indicated here as these different shapes. And you have 10 to the 11 different types of, of these, these uh, bacteriophages. And then you pan them over an analyte of interest, for example, TNT, uh, an explosive, where you might, you might want to sense that. And so what happens is certain, certain ones of them will bind to it and other ones will not. And so you wash away that, the ones that don't bind. You, you take the ones that do, you feed them some bacteria, they're very happy, they, they replicate, they have many more. And then you look at, you look at what these, these uh, proteins are down there, sorry, the peptide sequence down here, these amino acid sequence, and you look at them. And do they, do, or do they agree with each other? If they do, that's great. If not, do it again. Do it again and do it with harsher binding conditions. So make, them, make it a little bit harder for them to bind. And you do this a few, few times, and then you, you, when you get a consensus sequence, you get a, a, a peptide that has very specific binding to, to that analyte. So here's a molecule of TNT, and here's a, a peptide that, that, that was discovered that binds very specifically to that, to that molecule. So if you look at that the amino acid sequence, um, you see that, so here's, again, there's uh, 12 of them on, 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 on this uh, chain. And if you look at the one that, that they did for the TNT target, all, all of the top, uh, the abundance from, so they did it for four rounds, so all the top four here all have this WHW, this tryptophan histidine tryptophan uh, <coughs> sequence right at the beginning. And, and that, that's what really binds very specifically to TNT. We've also done it for T, DNT, and there's less of, less of a, a, a consensus among them. But you were able to get something that binds to TNT and does not bind to dinitrotoluene. So here's TNT. It has one, two, three nitro groups on it. Dinitrotoluene only has two. So here's, here's a measure of uh, the binding affinity. And if you don't have any sort of specific, you just take the random allotment, you don't get very good binding at all. For the, the, the binding peptide that, that is tailored for dinitrotoluene, you get good binding for DNT and not, no binding for TNT. And the exact opposite for TNT, you get very good binding for extremely good binding for TNT and only moderate binding for dinitrotoluene. And so what we've done is we've taken this and we've taken, taken these, these peptides and, and integrated them with a carbon nanotube transistor. So here's a cartoon image of two carbon nanotubes uh, going between two electrical contacts. And you measure the current going through that. You apply a voltage and you measure the current going through that circuit as you expose it to different things. And what, we've, what they've done is they've put a polymer on here and on that polymer they, they've added this um, the peptide receptor on top of this polymer. And then if you expose it to, to, so this is the current going through that, if you start exposing, to, exposing it to TNT at very low concentrations, one femtomolar, it, the, con, the current starts to increase. So that shows that this thing is actually sensitive to TNT. But uh, we don't want it just to be sensitive to TNT, we need it to be selective, because we want to know what we're, we're detecting. So here is again the current going through this, this circuit here as they expose it to different, different concentrations. So you have 10 micromolar of toluene, 
which is the base molecule of this. Very similar instruction. There's no, no response whatsoever. Again, 10 micromolar of 4 nitrotoluene and 2 nitrotoluene, two different types of mononitrotoluene, and you, you get no response. 1 nanomolar of dinitrotoluene, and you get a little response. But then you go down to 1 femtomolar, which is 1 millionth the concentration of a nanomolar, and you get this huge spike, showing that not only do we have something sensitive, sensitive that can measure at the femtomolar level, we have something that is selective to, to TNT. Now this, this process of the SPAGE display, uh, process to, to make these peptides that are selective, has been done for other uh, environmental toxicants. PBDE is a, a flame retardant that, that builds up in your body. We're working on, on getting uh, uh, sequences for that. And also pesticides here, alpha endosulfan and beta endosulfan. So we're looking at other, other uh, uh, peptide sequences that can be integrated with these carbon nanotube uh, transistors to make selective sensors. Another type of uh, uh, sensor I can talk about is a nanoparticle-based sensor. So um, here, here, this is an example of uh, a gas phase. That, that, the measurement there was a liquid phase uh, measurement. This is a gas phase measurement. And so it, there's these things called microheaters where you have this very thin membrane and you can heat it up to very high temperatures at very low power because it's so thin, it's very small, so it doesn't have much thermal mass. And you can put nanoparticles on them and you can get uh, uh, make sensors using and here's an example again, the current going through a circuit of this nanoparticle network. Uh, the blue line is a room temperature measurement done at 25 degrees Celsius, and it's actually been multiplied by 100. And this one is exposed to 50 parts per million of H2S. And you see there is some, some change in, in the, the current going through that at room temperature, but it's very slow to respond and very noisy, not very, not very strong. The signal is not very strong. However, when you heat that up to 300 degrees, you get a very sharp uh, response and it plateaus and you get a very, uh, very large response and a very fast response. And so you can take these, these micrometers and put whatever sort of nanoparticle you want, depending on what you want to detect. This one was tailored for H2S, uh, which is a toxic gas that uh, comes up from oil refiners and also very present in, in oil and, and natural gas reservoirs. And so you're able to heat this up at very low, only tens of milliwatts, and you're able to heat this up so you can get a very low power uh, sensor out of this um, using these materials. Now what, what we've done is we've, take this, take, we've, ta we've taken this, this sensing platform, instead of just heating it continuously, which is already low power, we've actually heated it very, with very short pulses to even minimize power even more. And so what you see here is a, a plot versus time of the conductance through the uh, sensor. And on the bottom side here you can see the uh, hydrogen sulfide reference sensor. The dotted line is the target, and the, the red, the solid line, is the uh, measured as a, from a, a, a reference sensor. And you can see that when there's no HS around, there's no response. And as soon as you expose it to H2S, the sensor responds. And we're able to get very good, very large, long, uh, strong responses with very low power. So that ten, those tens of milliwatts are now in the single milliwatt range because we're dealing in such a low duty cycle. And so we're enabling low power so you don't have to scavenge as much energy from the environment or your battery lasts longer, however you want to look at it. And you're able to get good, strong signals from, from uh, the analog that you're trying to measure. Here's a plot up here of, again, more of that data of that heat pulsing. And this is the uh, concentration of your hydrogen sulfide gas that you're delivering to it. And you can see as you increase the hydrogen sulfide concentration, the response of the sensor increases. And then when you bring the hydrogen concentration back down to zero, our sensor maps that reference sensor almost exactly. And so uh, this is the response. If you look at the average response versus uh, concentration, you get a good response curve here. So we're able to differentiate between, say, 200 ppm and 50 ppm. Um, and it's bit, here's the sort of error, the percentage error. Um, at zero, there's a large percentage error because it's normalized by the signal. You have a small signal, you have a large fractional error. But uh, here's the coin sensor, and we've got something that's always below 2%, and that's exactly the same, very similar to what we get for the photoluminescence detector, this $10,000 piece of equipment that, that, that uses um, um, kilowatts of power. And here we've got something that only uses milliwatts of power and with comparable results. Again, on the selectivity side, you don't want just something to respond to everything. You don't know what you're sensing. So you need to make sure that you have something selective. So again, here are those heat pulses where you get measurements um, uh, as you heat the sensor. And this is to 5 ppm H2S. Here we, it's, we've exposed it to water, 13,000 parts per million, or about 40% relative humidity. And that when you heat it, the conductance drops to zero. So that, that's the signal we're looking at. So we have no interference from water. And then for methane, there's no response whatsoever. And since HS is, is, exists in natural gas reservoirs, these are 
methane is the main component of natural gas, so that's why we detected for, tested for that. And water is everywhere. You can't get away from water. And so we showed that we have good selectivity as well as sensitivity. Okay, so those are two examples of a liquid phase and a gas phase measurement of using nanomaterials and nano devices to measure um, uh, environmental conditions. So now I'll get into energy, uh, our energy research. So we're doing research to be able to scavenge energy for these fixed um, devices. The, the community-based monitor, you want it to be able to scavenge energy from its environment so it can sustain power. Again, so we want to explore, understand, and develop nanotechnology-based energy scavenging and storage. We do some storage uh, research as well uh, to power these environmental monitoring applications. So I'll go into two different uh, examples today. One is nanowire-based solar cells, and the other one is uh, um, vibrational scavenging with piezoelectric polymers. So here, what you see uh, these three images are scanning electron micrograph images of uh, silicon nanowires. So that you take a sil uh, silicon wafer and you etch down in, control, in a controlled manner to, to create these uh, nanowires. And you get these arrays of nanowires. And so, uh, that, that this is, uh, so silicon is used for conventional uh, solar cells. Uh, but here's an example of, of, what we'll be, of using nanotechnology. And why, why do we care about what, does the nano, what do the nanowires offer? Well, one thing they offer is that Due, due to their, their, the, the array of these nanowires there, they actually trap the light very well. Silicon is a very poor absorber. Even, it makes, even though it makes the best solar cells, it doesn't absorb light very well. So you have to get a very thick piece of silicon if you want to make an efficient solar cell. And so what, 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 what the researchers in COINS have done is they've taken a, uh, a nanowire solar cell and compared it to a planar solar cell, a typical solar cell. And so here it's using only an 8 micron absorber, so the, the thickness beyond these nanowires is only 8 microns. And that's this, this blue line here. And that's comparable in efficiency. So this is the current versus voltage. What you want to see is you want to see a large current. So you want to be large down here. And then you want to see it extend a good amount into a positive voltage. So what they've been able to do is they've been able to, to, to get the similar efficiency with the 8 micron absorber compared to a 25 micron absorber. So you're able to use much less mass to, 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 to uh, uh, scavenge the same amount of energy. Um, and this, so you get output powers around 5 to 6 milliwatt uh, per centimeter squared, or efficiencies of uh, about 5%, which is quite good for nanomaterials. So the, the, the nanowires act as a, a way to trap the light much, so absorb the light much more efficiently in, in uh, those solar cells. Another uh, material we're looking at, um, silicon is, is a great material for, for solar cells, as I mentioned. Uh, it's, it's very expensive to produce, though. Silicon is everywhere. It's in sand, uh, but it, to, to extract very high purity silicon from the sand is very expensive. So a way to make uh, solar cells on very cheaply would be a, a great advantage. So here we have a cadmium sulfide nanowire, and you, just using a solution process, we're able to exchange some of that cadmium with co copper, and you're able to make this PN junction here, a radial PN junction, which is a, a great, great for uh, um, solar cells. You need a PN junction, and you have a very large uh, interface here which is what's, uh, again, the large surface area makes it advantageous for, for this, for this uh, for, uh, application. Again, here's your cadmium sulfide nanowire. You take it, you replace part of it with copper sulfide using lithographic techniques, and then you wire it up. And here's, uh, these are SEM images, artificial color, but you have these, these the, here's the PN junction, here's the, the core shell uh, copper sulfide with the cadmium sulfide on the inside, and here is uh, uh, just the copper, the cadmium sulfide. And if you go and you shine light and you raster your, your light beam over there, you can measure the photocurrent, and that's what this color here is. And so um, here is where you have the core shell, and you can see you get very high currents where you shine the light on that junction, showing that you have a good photocurrent and therefore a good photocell. And again, these, these efficiencies with these nanomaterials are about 5%. The top line solar cells made from silicon are about 20% or so. Uh, so we're not there yet, but we're using much less material and it's potential to to have a, a large impact. Another way that you can scavenge en energy from your environment is through vibrational energy. So you have things vibrating all around. If you can extract that energy and convert it to electrical energy, that would, be, that would be very advantageous. So here's an example of using polymer nanofibers, which are piezoelectric, which means that when you bend them, a voltage is, uh, uh, is generated on the ends. So you can take this, this polymer uh, nanofiber and you do it by a process called near field electrospinning, and you put it on any substrate you want. This is, you can put it on a flexible substrate. And this has been done by uh, Li Wei Lin in coins. And you, you can put these nanowires on, on these flexible substrates. And then when you bend those flexible substrates, they will generate voltage and, and scavenge energy. So again, as you, 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 you 
you start stretching, you start you have the increase in your current, and then you stop you, you hold it and it drops down, and then you release it and it, and the current goes the other way. So you can if there's vibrations going on, you can take this this flexible subject that's moving around and be able to turn that some of that energy into electrical energy and and, and use that for, for powering your uh, sensors and electronics. Okay, so another one again for the mobile platform. Obviously, mobility is a is a big need to have a mobile uh, device. So uh, again, so we're looking for a platform that can carry the coin sensors for and has all-terrain mobility. I'll talk a little bit about the Gecko-inspired nanoadhesives, uh, and then also uh, this the Clash, the Climbing Autonomous Sprawled Hexapod. So here's that image again. And so uh, the, the, the Gecko here, and you, you have, they have these uh, nanofibers on them. And so, however, you, you don't just want nanofibers on there, you need to have some sort of hierarchical structure on there because if you have a, a, a flat surface with some nanofibers on there, that works well for a very flat surface. But as soon as you start dealing with a, a bumpy surface, you're not touching all the surface that you want to. So if you embed some, some periodicity into that structure, you, it can conform to that surface and you get very good adhesion. And so we're looking at different ways of making hierarchical structures. Here's one where they actually just draw, uh, make slits in here. Also taking microfibers and, and, and putting uh, nanofibers on top of them to deal with different uh, uh, roughness sizes. So here's Clash. It's a, uh, it's a, a robot that, that runs on a DC motor, and it's very lightweight and very fast. It can run about a, a, a meter per second, um, and uh, it's, it's, it's only about 10 grams, and uh, it can climb up a lot of different surfaces. So here, um, you can either use a claw, so here's a, it has claws on its front feet, and it can climb up a cloth almost vertically. Or you can oh, click that one again. So, or, or if you put these gecko adhesives on here, it's a very smooth acrylic uh, surface, and it's able to crawl right off that smooth surface by using this, these gecko-like adhesives. And so, using a com combination of gecko gecko-inspired adhesives and claws, much like uh, a cockroach actually has claws and sends some fibers on it, and it can climb also to <laughs> many interesting places. Um, and, and so you're able to, to get both be able to climb smooth surfaces and rough surfaces, such as here's the graduate student who, who developed this uh, Paul Bergmeier, and he's climbing up his couch. <laughs> so here's uh, some more uh, footage of that. So another area that we do research is electronics and wireless. Uh, so we can so we can measure those environmental monitors, whether it's on a personal or community-based 
or, or on the mobile platform, which you just saw, and send that uh, 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 wirelessly out, and also do very efficient electronics, because electronics can actually be, uh, consume a lot of power. So, again, so ultra-low power electronics uh, for computation and storage, and also for wireless communication to, to, to enable these um, uh, applications. So, uh, the one example I'm going to give today is a carbon nanotube radio. So, in order to have a radio, you need uh, four components, not including a speaker. So you need an antenna to receive the signal. You need to tune, so you need to filter out all the other stuff and get, the, get what you, you want. You need to amplify that signal, and then you need to de demodulate it to, 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 to extract the, kick, the uh, signal wave on top of the carrier wave. So it's sent on you know, 101.3 FM, but the, the audio wave on that is much lower frequency. So you need to extract that, that lower frequency wave on top of the uh, uh, higher frequency. And it would be possible uh, to, to, to construct this with, uh, with nanomaterials. Uh, so you can take the carbon nanotube, it's very long and, and, and straight, it can be very many millimeters long, you could use that as an antenna. You can tune this, you can have this, uh, a car, uh, this is a multi-wall carbon nanotube, and you can actually change the, 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 the length and be able to tune what frequency it oscillates at. You can, have, you can make amplifiers from carbon nanotubes, and you can also make diodes, uh, which is, would act as a, a demodulator. But that's not, uh, you don't need to do all those different things. You can actually do it with just one, one single carbon nanotube. And so what you have here is you have a, a carbon nanotube that's a field emitting, meaning it's, uh, there's a large negative voltage applied to this electrode, and electrons are actually hopping off and flying to this positively charged electrode. And so this, this, the shape of this uh, nanotube actually acts as the antenna. And the, um, the frequency, the natural frequency at which it will, will oscillate gives it its, its tuning. And the amplification comes from uh, the fact that you're in the field emission mode, so any sort of change in its, its uh, geometry will drastically affect the, the field emission current. And then also, due to this non-linearity of, of, of the, the, the oscillation, you get, some, you get some demodulation from that. And so you're able to excite this carbon nanotube by, by exposing it to, to radio frequency. So here's when it's off resonance. You have a, a long, straight carbon nanotube, uh, and it's field emitting, which uh, See its bright tip, so that's showing that it's field emitting. This is in a transmission electron microscope. And then when you when you tune into that frequency, you can actually see that this thing is vibrating all over the place. You can see the base is fairly stable, but you can kind of see its, uh, its, its terminal points here. It's a little bit hard, so you can see it's, it's just it's, it's just vibrating there. So you can take this thing and you can excite it with radio frequency, just like you would a, a regular radio, and you can actually uh, use it as a radio receiver. So they're tuning the, the, the frequency to reach the, the, the intrinsic frequency of the carbon nanotube. And once it's on resonance, you can see it's got all blurry because it's, it's moving, it's, it's doing its amplification and it's uh, receiving that signal so you can't see it. A little bit static, but that can be filtered from the electronics. This is the raw data coming out of there. And then it's be, been detuned that the carrier frequency to change the channel. We're not listening to the layla anymore, and so you can't. The thing doesn't vibrate anymore. So that's an example of using nanotechnology for, for uh, uh, novel wireless uh, applications. So, in addition to doing the research in each of those five categories, we're also uh, taking integrating all those different things. We're taking sensors and electronics and energy scavengers and building systems around those. So, as I as I showed earlier, there's this. Uh, we've made this coin sensing system that can house. Uh, sensor. It can measure multiple types of sensors, any sort of sensor you want it to measure elect electronically, either the nanoparticle sensor, the carbon nanotube peptide sensor, or a graphene sensor, or any sort of electronic sensor you want to give us, we would be able to mount it on here and be able to measure it. Uh, it can also do heater control if it needs to heat the devices at all, for example, for that nanoparticle uh, sensor. It has an onboard uh, CPU, a, a, a microprocessor. Uh, it has a, a radio that's compliant with this uh, IEEE 802.15.4, and it has uh, wired USB communication links. It also has energy scavenging uh, capabilities and uh, can charge uh, batteries. And so we've uh, taken taken this uh, coin sensing system, as we call it, and we've we've mounted different types of sensors on there. And we can the the, the idea is to take this this uh, uh, sensing system and mount it on top of the the crawler, or have it be a standalone system. And it, since it has wireless communication, it can actually communicate through a wireless access point, so you have an access point and then send that data out to wherever you want it in the world. You just have to log into this uh, 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 server 
and you'd be able to stream data. Here you can see this is actual data from a, from a sensor, an ammonia sensor. So this is a, there's a, was water on here, and they dropped ammonium hydroxide on there, and it drastically changed the current because you're able to monitor to get that data over the wireless link. Now, recent, most recently, we've actually taken the server out of the mix, and we're able to take communicate directly from the iPhone to the um, the sensing system it, itself. So you can have these things in a room. You can go in there with your your smartphone and. You Open up your coins application. You say, "What you know? What's the what's what's the situation? What's the the environmental conditions?" And it can send that information back. We've also um, so we can take this thing and we can mount it on the, the crawler, or we can also use that thing again as a fixed station that we would then interrogate with something else. So you could have these things. If these things are all over the place, you could send in your crawler. You could go ask for what the the, the environmental conditions are, and then and then do do something with that information. And so what, we, what we've done here is we've mounted this, uh, so here is our, our coin sensing system, and here's a, uh, uh, one of those crawlers. This one's actually made out of balsa wood. So and, and we've, we've mounted one, a humidity sensor on there, a, coin, a coins generated humidity sensor. And so what you'll see is uh, you come over to it. So now these things are right next to each other, but they could be across the room. We just don't have the camera to show that. So we breathed on it. It's thinking, it sends a signal and says, go run. But it could send anything. It could say, you know, Stop. Go back. You could say, you know, go get the, go, go tell the uh, rescuers there's somebody here. Um, so you can mount any sort of sensor you wanted on there, and it would be able to communicate between those two things. So those are sort of the ways that we're taking uh, the sensors and being able to communicate that, that information wirelessly, so that you could actually do something useful with that information. And so with that, if someone's, oops, here, with that someone just. We have one o'clock. So this, so that, that, that's. I'd like to conclude with that. We're doing research in all these different areas: mobility, sensing, energy scavenging, electronics, and wireless. And we're trying to integrate all those things into one system to to, to enable personal, community-based, and environmental monitoring. And with that, I can take any questions. Ideally, when, when they get commercialized, these uh, sensors, they can detect uh, organic uh, substances. Sure, that's a, that's a great question. And um, I'm, I'm not sure what the, uh, the, the carbon nanotube based the peptide ones, I'm not sure how stable those are, because um, those, those are typically done in the short term. But the, I'm involved with the nanoparticle research, and we've looked over three months. So we've tested them, you know, in combined, put them on the shelf, test them some more, put them on the shelf some more, put them back. So three months, they seem to be stable. They didn't um, degrade. You know. They didn't degrade over that time frame. Of course, for, for some of these applications, um, you want them to last for a year, so that's that's still to be determined. Um, but for the the, the liquid-based one, that's typically that's more of the uh, sort of go and measure. You want to go, you would go to a field and measure something you could, because again, a lot of times they take a sample and bring it back to the lab. That one's tailored towards going towards the your well, dipping in the well. Do I have any pesticides in my well? Do I have any this? In my so you could have that on a, a very cheap, you know, uh, reusable sort of disposable sensing phone and have a reader that would plug in. Yeah. For the gas uh, sensor, so mm -hmm. I still try. Um, are there any limitations to the molecule that could be sensed? Carbon monoxide? Um, carbon monoxide would definitely be able to, in fact, the, your, um, there's very good carbon monoxide sensors out there, so they're not really developing that.
can find a way to, to fabricate these with, uh, with very, very well controlled processing, we might be able to eventually beat them or enhance conventional electronics, uh, convent, sorry, conventional solar cells. In addition to the, the data that I showed today and the projects that I showed, we're looking at using uh, uh, silver uh, nanoparticles on top of conventional solar cells because, as I said, it's a bad absorber. But those silver nanoparticles actually enhance the, the, the local fields and scattering it so you get much more absorption of your your conventional solar cell by putting something that increases the, the light absorption efficiency. So you're absolutely right. We're not there. It's really the efficiency that gets there, but that doesn't mean that since we're not there yet, doesn't mean we shouldn't be trying. Yeah. The cloth robots are incredibly awesome. Are you planning to use them the next time there's some sort of project? So uh, we could use them. To, uh, we, don't, we don't have plans to do that. Um, that. That is the eventual goal. Um, we don't manufacture them. You saw the graduate student. That's doing it. We, in order for it to be effective, we need to be mass producing these things. Um, but we're, we're not there yet. But that is that's what we'd like to enable. So maybe maybe in a couple of years you'd like to start a company and we could uh, show, show you how to do it. Uh, yeah, we're going to see them scurrying around the airports and you know saving us from taking off all my clothes when we go through security. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> um, that that's a potential one. Uh, airports, um, they might be, but airports they have uh, you know they have well control. You'd be able to put sensors that would need mobility. Um, however, one thing that would be useful is port security. So um, you can put uh, well, another thing again that I didn't mention here, just due to the uh, lack of time, is uh, looking at some ways to detect uh, radiation. About the amount of radiation detector on them and have them run through shipping containers to see if there's any fissile material, any sort of uh, nuclear bomb or anything like that. Which is a big, uh, there's a big thing, and you use helium three now for those detectors, and we're running out of helium three, and so we're going to need another. another um, so that would be one thing, sort of port security. I don't, I'm not sure airports would really be seeing some of these other things, the sort of fixed monitors, sure. You can see those. Yeah? yeah um, a couple of years ago, the micro cantilever sensors were a big thing. Do you see this supplanting many of those applications? Yeah, so we, we did look at, at some some of the micro cantilever, um, the piezo resistive micro cantilevers. So yeah, these, these, these could definitely, we, we've sort of uh, left those behind in favor of some of these other nanoelectronic ones. So I do think that these could, could supplant some. I was thinking in terms of mercury sensing, uh, vapor and liquid uh, mercury. Yeah, so so um, we are looking at other ways to, to sense mercury and electrochemically and things like that. Um, on the, the, the data that I, I shared on peptides, those are more uh, tailored for the individual, the, the medium sized molecules uh, that you can If you talk about a single atom of mercury, you can't really. Tailor multiple binding sites for a single atom. There's going to be one binding site for that particular application. So that's more for the uh, organic molecules and things like that. Um, but there's there's definitely you know some electrochemical. These carbon nanotubes can be used for uh, electrochemical electrodes. And I know that uh, sensing uh, mercury's electrochemistry, there's a lot of research going on in that area. Yeah. So that would also possibly be the next step from MEMS down to. To now. Absolutely, yeah. So, so one thing I, I didn't share here um, was uh, they, they made uh, uh, using a carbon nanotube. Maybe it was five or six years ago. They using a multi-wall carbon nanotube to actually remove the the uh, outer walls, and they put a rotor on the the, the outer wall of the, the center part, and they were actually able to make that rotor move around. So, actually, made were able to make a nanometer size uh, motor. I was thinking more in terms of replacing the accelerometers. Sure, sure. You know, now state of the art. Now is a very yeah, absolutely. So um, for that, you know, you'd have to, they're already pretty small. So if you need the smaller one, you you could make a smaller one. It gets a little bit the smaller, and smaller it gets more difficult to get to make things. So they work pretty darn well now. If you needed something, if you had a you know, you had a little fly that was moving around or something, you know, a nano fly, then maybe you want an, uh, or sorry, a micro, a milli or a micro, you know, size fly that was flying around. Then yes, a, nan a nanometer size accelerometer would be very useful. Um, they, they, they could be, you know, you never know where, where it's going to go. Yeah. You thought of doing any kind of biological interface kind of thing where you might take a fly and stick a sensor on it and have it buzz around? Um, we, we are doing things like that, but um, I've seen pictures of uh, you know, cockroaches with wires coming out of their heads and things like that. Um, <laughs> and, you know, when you're trying, when you talk about flying in particular, it's really hard to beat nature. And so before you see any sort of you know, nanomechanical fly flying around, you probably see a fly with some LEDs on its head before you see anything else. What about using sensors to detect um, biologics? Yeah, 
so so um, that's not really in our our goal, but there are a lot of people who are using the, those those things again, electrochemical um, measurements using these carbon nanotubes as, since they have such a high surface area, you can get very high high um, very sensitive measurements, and those are those are used for um, you know for glucose. And people are doing research into making glucose monitors and also um, other biological um, you know disease markers and things like that. Um, Yeah, so so these sort of the sort of readout mechanisms of the carbon nanotube transistors could be could be very useful, or the other nanoelectronics. But there's it's really on the, the biology side of bigger H1N1 is going to have those specific proteins on there. So you could take just like we we put the peptides on these carbon nanotubes, you could take those specific proteins or whatever it is that is that are displayed on the H1N1 